I don't see Daniel. Um, Lucas, Dean? Here. Donna, Chen? Uh, Nicholas, Garber? Yep. Patrick Healy? Here. Uh, Gary Heaton? Did Gary, I might not have updated this. I think Gary, um, Kareem, did you replace yep. Gary? Yeah. That's right. I need to update oh. the, the information. Uh, Ray Heron? Here. Okay. Lee Condor? Here. Uh, Marty Meth? Here. And Travis Piatella? Here. And then I just, I'm just admitting Donna right now. Sounds good. Uh, and I think next would be the, the emergency statement. Do we have to still do that at this point, Sandy? We do. All right. Do you want me to I read have, it? I don't, I don't have the language, so okay. go ahead, please. This meeting of the Citizen Transportation Advisory Committee is being held pursuant to the Code of Virginia Section 2.2-3708.2, which allows a public body to hold electronic meetings when the locality in which it is located has declared a local state of emergency, and the catastrophic nature of the emergency makes it impracticable or unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of the meeting is to provide for the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. This meeting is being held via electronic video and audio means through Zoom online meetings and is accessible to the public. There will be an opportunity for public comment during that portion of the agenda. Notice has been provided to the public through notice at the TJPDC offices to the media, website posting, and agenda. The meeting minutes will reflect the nature of the emergency, that the meeting was held by electronic communication means, and the type of electronic communication means by which the meeting was held. A recording of the meeting will be posted at tjpdc.org within 10 days of the meeting. Thank you, Sandy. Mm -hmm. All right, um, <clears throat> next is uh, matters for the public. I'm not sure if I see anyone here. Does anyone recognize any names that are not part of our committee? I don't think so either. All right, so uh, no matters from the public in that case. Um, and so moving on then from the to uh, draft of the meeting minutes, have you guys had a chance to uh, review the meeting minutes? Any questions, if so? Yeah, I was gonna, for the second meeting in a row, it seems to say that I wasn't there when I was. I'm not sure if <laughs> something systematic there or what, but. Oh yeah, then there's no X against your name. Yeah, so we might wanna have that updated. Was anyone else uh, possibly miss? If not, we might wanna add that into the notes. Um, there was other, one other thing that I had a question on, Sandy, or if anyone can recollect this. Uh, we were talking about the, uh, the possible uh, ped and uh, bike bridge uh, from the river, river front, oh, excuse me, <laughs> the river uh, park <clears throat> down in Southern Charlottesville. We were talking about different communities to include. Um, I didn't see any note about uh, uh, the local, it's, it's not coming to my mind right now, but uh, it's that, uh, it's not Weaver, it, it's it's something textile related. Uh, the Woolen Wool, Mills. Woolen Mills, Mills, yeah. Yeah, I just wanna make sure that was noted as, as a potential uh, stakeholder that we wanna include. I didn't see that when I scanned through it, I'm scanning through it right now. We did, we did include that in our like future discussion. So it was definitely okay. um, involved, but we can, we can add a note, let's see. We can add a note under that number six that um, you're talking about having a representative from the Woolen Mills community on the stakeholder committee was recommended. You got that Gretchen? I do. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, any other thoughts before we motion to uh, approve? Okay, Travis's uh, attendance and also that one small note about Willem Mills then. I, uh, do I hear a motion to approve? Anyone willing? I move to approve. Thank you, Lee, any one second? Second. Got a second. Um, so, uh, I mean, does anyone want to say nay? <laughs> we could just skip it if you guys like. Anyone against or anyone, everyone in favor? Yes. Cool, I did it the opposite way. Um, it looks like we have it then, there's no nays. Sandy. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so meetings are approved. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, with Chuck. We have the uh, smart scale round five updates, presentation discussion. 
All right. Let's see here. If I share my screen real quick here now. Um, let's see. Go to presentation mode. There we go. All right. Does everybody see my screen? Yes. All right. Okay, we're coming up on round five of Smart Scale. Um, and it seems like every round we make some tweak to the uh, process and the scoring. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the changes they're looking at doing this time, um, mainly in the environmental, for the environmental factor and the land use. The land use is the biggest one of the two. Um, but I'm going to go through both of them with you guys. Um, all right, next slide. <clears throat> Like I said, we're talking about the environmental has two components on air quality, energy component, and then a, a natural and cultural resources impact component. And then land uses, it has two components, but they're really one component. We just, we look at two different things, but they're the same thing. We just look at two different aspects of it. Um, so the next slide. Okay, for um, history of the environmental, um, first round, it was, we had projects that in smart scale got all their points from env uh, environmental. So uh, we definitely made some changes after round one to uh, correct that. We really hadn't, didn't make anything in round two. In round three, we, we uh, for round three and between three and four, we made some changes and um, we're just modifying those um, changes uh, this round. Um, we converted the E2 to a, a negative number where that's trying to measure the impact area. Um, and it's going to be subtracted from the improvements that you're going to get from the air quality component. And it actually could be a negative number to your overall score too. So, um, okay, the next slide. Is so the E1, it's um, basically air, it's measuring the uh, change in uh, round three to four was uh, 100%, um, but it's measuring, it's trying to measure the amount of non SOV users that the project's going to attract um, to the area. So it's it, by doing, by how it does that, it's going to look at diverting them from the VMTs that are on the roadway now. Um, so it also gives a energy component for the type of fleet makeup. And that that's something they're actually changing this time because they're not going to have that this time. So they're taking that out. And then uh, it gives points for freight. Uh, it, if you increase the delay or reduce the delay, you're improving the uh, freight travel through the corridor. So you're, you're getting some credit for that. Uh, improvement. Um, and then, uh, like I said, for the environmental impacts, those are captured in the cost. All right, next. These are the factor areas that we uh, score applications on, um, and you get a certain point for these various types of, of improvements that you might be including in your project. Um, and those are, those are used to, in the E1, um, and those are multiplied by the um, amount of non-SOV vehicles that are, um, that they basically take off the network. Um, and um, then that total is summed and it's added to the freight. The freight is basically, like I said, it's looking at the percentage of uh, heavy vehicles multiplied by the um, increased delay or the reduced delay. So you're getting a, a number there. And depending on what the factor is, you can, it's one here, but one of the things they're looking at changing is changing that to uh, account for um, 
the amount of increase in um, the, the amount of decrease in the delay. So we'll see that coming up. Uh, next. Um, okay, so we looked at eight different scenarios. We're really in six different scenarios and then seven and eight are just combinations of some of the other ones. But what they settled on was uh, option two, which is looking at changing how that, uh, those numbers are categorized uh, that I went through before with that table where they're looking at the different um, categories of non-SOV users. Um, currently, they basically sum the total number of non-SUVs and then times it by each one of those factors and then sum that number. Uh, what they're doing now is they're going to, for sidewalks, they're only going to multiply that factor by the amount of people that would be non-SOV users that would be using the sidewalk versus total. So you're basically, we're double counting it before. So this would uh, better normalize that process so that we get a more precise calculation. And um, the freight is separate and freight is measured in a different unit than S SUV SOVs. So the way they're weighting it um, is one of the things they're changing too. Instead of adding them together and um, then, then normalizing it, they're gonna normalize them separately and then add them together um, at a 50-50 split. Um, five is, this is our first attempt to look at CO2 uh, offsets. And this is a methodology we're gonna try to implement this round um, to try to capture some of that because it's not really a good tool to do that with right now. And then, like I said, eight, what we found is that um, by combining the two, because one of them has better freight, um, is, is sort of tendency to give you a better freight score and the other one's tending to give you a better S SOV score, non-SOV score. So by combining the two, you're getting the better best of both, so to speak. Chuck, I'm not sure if it's now's the best time to ask, but um, I know before you, if you go back to the slide, the previous slide, um, the points were divvied up between the um, kind of multimodal and freight categories, 8.5 and 1.5 multiplied by then SOV users. And I know in the new, the new changes are going to like a 50%, 50% weighting. Yeah, I'm going to um, show you that. I'll show you that revised table when we get to it. Yep. They're going to go okay. to, this Fine. is how it currently does. Right. I'll and hold right, off what, then and ask when we get what there. What we're going to do is, um, well, that's what these are, are about, those changes that we're making this for this round. Yeah, so no, I was going to ask though, is the, is the changing in the 50-50 weighting split seen as like increasing the percentage for freight or is it just, there was not really a, a way to allocate that percentage split under the current process because um, they're measured we're, under different- we're, like, we're, we're basically sort of evaluating them separately and then how do we combine the two? So they get right, so like the, rating. Right. So today because though, you can't really say there's like a percentage weighting to each one. It's just however the, the numbers add up uh, and then on the- When we get to that in the end, I'll show you what they're doing. Okay, thanks. All right. Because I've got a slide that shows that, so. Gotcha. All right. Um, okay, currently all the points are totaled, multiplied by the S non-SOV users. And, and like I said, that causes, you're getting double counting on the, or you're getting more S non-SOV users points than you would actually get. Um, and then the, the SOVs and the freight components, they're not in the same unit. So when you add them together, you're not adding apples to apples. So that was one of the issues that they were trying to resolve. And then the other thing that the special, uh, um, the, the special accommodation points, they were gonna basically eliminate that totally because it's not really giving you any credit for non-SOV or freight. It's just another way, another, part of the vehicle fleet. So adding a charging station out there is not necessarily gonna encourage uh, people not to drive. It just gives those 
uh, hybrid vehicles a place to park where they can charge their vehicles. So they felt that that wasn't something that was encouraging um, non-SOV users. Um, so basically here's how we're doing it now. And this is where we can get into the points. Um, e the current E1 is what we're using now. And then the proposed is E2. And you can see where in this example, they basically have a total of 59 non-SOV trips and your times in it multiplying that by each one of these factors, which is giving you a overly large number for the non-SOV points. And this proposal is basically going to only multiply it by the number of points that a number of increased users at that particular item generates. So that's more reflective of the accuracy of the, of the data that we're getting. And then you get the um, total uh, non-SUV, add those up and you get that total of 100. And then um, that's normalized. So instead of normalizing it before, you would add these two together and then you would normalize the total 3,900 um, to get your final E1 score. This one, you're normalizing this component of the score, and then you're gonna no normalize this freight component of the score. And then you're gonna add those two together at a 50-50 split. Does that make sense, Travis? Yeah, so, so it sounds like there was essentially no percentage weighting between the two before. You just added up the total numbers. Yep. The 442 plus 3515. Okay, so I, I just really wanna know if the changing of the 50, 50 percent weighting was seen as like increasing the freight component or decreasing it but it sounds like it's really it's normal it wasn't really a percentage data. before because you didn't even calculate it like that yeah it wasn't it was just added together and then they then they normalized it so this is actually doing a better job trying to capture actually what we're trying to capture within the same units instead of mm -hmm. having it be totally different and then trying to normalize it later Right. So, um, all right, the next slide. Um, like I said, we're, we don't have a tool to do um, greenhouse gas emissions. So we're doing a pilot study and it's supposed to wrap up this summer or next summer. And hopefully we'll have a better way to calculate uh, CO2 uh, emissions. So, I mean, that's the part that we're working on with option five. Um, so this is our attempt to try to come up with a way to capture that um, is option five. So this will be another, uh, that other component. That was the first one was option two. This is be option five. Um, we basically are using some of the existing data that we have um, from E1 for the non-SOV users, the hours of delay from the C2 calculation um, trip lengths are based on the um, how National Household Survey average numbers um, and the smart scale segment links based on the C1, C2 data, data set. And then we're using a standard conversion from miles per gallon and uh, CO2, CO2 per gallon to get their, your CO2 quantity that we're going to use. We're, going to use for the offset. All right, here's basically the data that we're using to do the calculations with um, and where we're pulling it from. Um, for the pedestrian, we're using the 0.67 miles, which is the average from the National Household Survey, Travel Survey, and same for bicyclists, that's 3.54. Uh, those are both from that survey. And then the trip lengths, those are multiplied by the trip length, the transit trips are multiplied by the trip lengths um, that are calculated based on your segment lengths. And then um, these are all summed and then it's basically converted to CO2 using this equation. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right. So for the freight component, um, they're basically looking at it similarly. Um, they've got to take the uh, freight numbers and convert it from 
uh, person hours of delay to vehicle hours of delay so we can get the freight number, uh, heavy vehicle hourly delay. And then that's multiplied by the truck percentage. And then we're converting it using this equation to get the uh, amount of CO2 offset for based on freight. And then these two are added together to give you the total CO2 offset number. All right, any questions on that? All right, here's a breakdown of how that calculation would work. So you're basically looking at the different categories, times in it by the trip length and the number of users to get your VMT. And then your uh, segments are basically whatever your segment is summed for those different two different items, park and ride lot and the bus. And then you're adding those up and then you're multiplying it through the equation to get your uh, non SOV CO2 offset. And then the freight is basically your uh, delay times your uh, persons per vehicle times your truck percentage and that's gonna give you your truck delay reduction. And then that's multiplied through the equation to get your freight CO2 offset. And then those are added together. Chuck, I, I have a question. Um, assuming SOV is single occupancy vehicle, uh, what about CO2 offset for single offset, for sing CO2 offset for single occupancy? occupancy vehicles. Doesn't that count for anything? Well, that, what, how we're doing this is we're basically, um, when we build the sidewalk, we're taking vehicles off the road. And so we're back calculating what the CO2 amount for those vehicles being pulled off the road is. Well, just to clarify a bit though, my, my understanding is that it's, you get the same number of points, whether you're just a sidewalk project or if you're like, a widening project that includes a sidewalk. So it seems like it's not like kind of overall net VMT change. It, it is just a number of non-SOV users you increase, right? Yeah, we're just looking at uh, when they do this, uh, the uh, congestion uh, calculation, they look at the what the improvements are. And if you're adding sidewalk, you're gonna get a, uh, um, you're gonna reduce the VM, the volume on that roadway by a certain amount to, um, provide the for the pedestrians that are going to be using that quarter within that quarter mile radius of their or mile radius of that facility. So it's not looking at all the VMT on the road, just what you might take off that's within that distance. And then you're ca back calculating what the CO2 for that improvement would be by removing those vehicles from the road. I guess quick question based off of Travis, that might be what you just said, but um, so if you're adding a lane, for example, and a sidewalk, so you're technically adding more cars, it's not counting that addition of the extra cars. That's not being captured in any way. It's just the side, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, and I agree, <laughs> but we don't, we don't have a lot of tools to use and we're looking at what the um, this portion of it's going to do. And that's why we're looking at that study to come up with a tool that's actually going to give us a better idea how to measure greenhouse gas Excuse me. emissions. Just, but you're quickly, right. If you're adding a lane, you're going to basically increase the amount of CO2 by induced demand or diversion or whatever you want to call it. Um, um, so, but it, yeah, we're not really taking that into account. And Chuck, I was just going to quickly ask, you mentioned the, the statewide greenhouse gas pilot. I know they're doing two parts. One is the statewide look, and then another one is like the specific project pilot. Do you know if there are, is summer 2022 the timeline for both of those? I you know think so, but I'm not positive. I, okay. I don't know. I'm not really sure. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. So any other questions about that? I mean, this is, this is our way to try to capture it because before we didn't, we weren't capturing it at all. So this is just another way to try to get a grasp on what, what those numbers might be. And hopefully we'll get more stuff and we can include those for, next, for the next round after round five, for round six, 
um, once we have a better tool to use to calculate that, what that might be. All right, um, so basically quantif uh, option eight is putting these two together. Um, we did look at modifications to uh, option two to uh, look at the magnitude of the freight um, item. And that's where you're looking at, you're scaling the multiplier um, depending on the amount of of delay increase or delay reduction. Um, but like I said, option two skews towards freight and option uh, five skews towards non-SOVs. So it's basically, if we can combine the two, we're gonna get a better, uh, a better way, a more accurate way to do it. It's not the best, but it's, it's more accurate than what we were using before. So, um, like I said, we're modifying the option two and then we're just adding it to option five with a, by a 50-50 weighting. And I think I've got the table to show that. So this is the part down here on the left, lower left corner is the really the change right there is you've got zero to two. If your delay is, is that up, you get a 0.5 multiplier instead of the one. And if it's uh, two to a hundred, you get a one. And if it's over a over hundred delay reduction, you're gonna get a two to that flight, to the freight number. And that's, that's basically the change. And then, like I said, they're doing a 50-50 split for um, the modification when they add it together to, with E2. Any questions about that? All right, here's the results of the E1 part. Um, uh, just, the, before you go, um, I was trying to unmute myself. Oh, how sorry. Those, those figures, those numbers that were used as the proportion, how were they all decided on? Which number for this uh, for, delay reduction? Yes. I, the, the, I don't know. The, That's the range they, they looked at and they, uh, they went to use. I, I'm not sure where they came up with that actually from, but I can ask that question. Uh, I would really like to know because I, I am, I'm just concerned that um, most of these numbers that they're using, there is just, I don't know the basis, let me put it this way, that I don't know the basis of them using those numbers. Because if you change those numbers slightly, it can make a significant difference to the, the different projects. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would like to know how they were, um, the process that was used to select them, that's all. For the yes. delay reduction numbers? These, 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 yes, these delay reduction numbers, yes. Okay, okay, I, I will, I'll follow up with uh, the OIP folks and see if I can track that down on where they came up with those ranges. Mm -hmm. I mean, a 200 point reduction in delay is, is significant. Um, I, yeah, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Person hours of delay, that's a lot of delay to reduction. Mm -hmm. um, most of it's gonna basically be within that middle range. So they possibly could refine it more. I don't know, but we can, I can ask that question. Mm -hmm. Part of what we're doing here is um, they wanna get feedback. They're gonna bring this back to the uh, CTB in December. Um, and they want to have comments back in so that we can uh, they can make some tweaks if they need to. We've already given them a bunch. And they've already made a bunch of tweaks already. So, um, but more is is a better is a good thing. So, okay. Um, now get into some of the results for the E1 measure. Um, basically, this is the list of the projects from round four in the Culpeper District. It really didn't change anything um, for most of the projects in the district. Um, you had a little bit up in the northern part where uh, this project went out and this project went in. Um, but on the whole, it didn't really affect many of the pro There wasn't a lot of movement. Um, both these projects, I think Emmett Street was on the bubble. Um, so Covington's Corner is out in the middle of nowhere. and um, there's not a lot of uh, 
the volumes are pretty low there. So you're not going to see a lot of benefit from, um, and it's not a, it's not a signal or anything. So, um, 20 and 522 is a, is a signalized intersection that's getting converted to a roundabout. So by allowing the traffic to move uh, freer through that intersection, you are going to see some improvements and some reduction in delay. I mean, in delay and, uh, um, but it doesn't have a lot of non-COV users because it's in both these are pretty much in the rural area. So any questions about that? All right. Um, e I have, um, okay. Quick question. Why does the, I'm assuming these are in Charlottesville? Not all of them. These are all, over, so, the, or, all over the district. Like the hydraulic road, 29, Old Lynchburg. Why does the district say Culpeper there? Because it is, is Culpeper district. Oh, okay. The, the Culpeper district runs from uh, Fauquier County, 66 in the north to Albemarle County, um, then you go into Nelson or Lynchburg district once you get to go into Nelson County. Okay, so even like the Emmett Street and everything is considered part of the Culpeper district. Yeah, we've got Louisa County, Fluvanna, Orange, Culpeper, uh, Green, Madison, Fauquier, Rappahannock, Albemarle. They're all part of uh, Culpeper district. Gotcha. Thanks. Yep. All right, um, E2 measures, basically your resource, cultural resources impacts. Um, and basically this is how it's run now. They, um, you have the project, they'll buffer it with a quarter mile buffer, and then they'll look at what the impacts are on those cultural resources and determine how many acres of each cultural resource that they're impacting. And then those are totaled up. And then um, whatever type of environmental document is deemed appropriate for that project, they'll, they assign a percentage to that. Um, and then that is multiplied by that acreage to give you uh, what your environmental document acreage is. And then as long as that doesn't exceed the acres of the project, that's the acres that are used for this analysis. All right. Um, basically, this is the uh, purpose of this revision is to just really look at the tier uh, at the uh, quarter mile buffer and because you've got some projects where you're not having any impacts outside of the existing right of way or the roadway. So why are we going out a quarter mile to look at buffer um, when you're not having any, any impacts beyond what's already in the right of way. And then the, the other item was currently we we pull the uh, environmental files from environmental division and we basically use those uh, now and they update those uh, environmental will update those databases that we may not have the most current data so we're basically going to have environmental division um, uh, provide us those layers directly for this analysis as opposed to us using the layers that we may get we'll get from them but we don't know how old they are um, so everything else is going to basically stay the same. So for the tiering, we're looking at um, 30 foot buffer for projects that are tier one, which are, I'll get into that. I'll have a table which shows the tiering for the different types of project. Eighth mile for tier two and a uh, quarter mile for tier three. Um, and most of our projects are tier one projects. Um, and we'll, I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, this is the tiering criteria for the different types of projects. Like I said, construction of a shared use path is tier one project. Um, you get into tier two or your improve, uh, improvements to park and ride, freight improvement, rail improvements, inner city passenger, passenger rail stations and station improvements, new park and ride lot. Um, then you get into the tier threes where you're doing managed lanes, doing major widening projects, new bridges, those kind of new interchange. These are your tier three projects. So basically we're gonna uh, look at that buffer based on the type of project it is, as opposed to keeping it the same for every project, no matter what the effects might be. 
Any questions on that? Yeah, Chuck, I was going to note it, looking at the list, I was surprised to see a couple of them like station improve, or like it says new inner city passenger rail station or station improvements. And there's another one saying new station or station improvements. It does seem like if you have station improvements that are totally within the existing developed area of a site, I'm, I guess I'm not, it seems like there could be some cases there where tier two may not make sense versus tier one. Okay, I mean, we can add though those can be part of the discussion. Um, uh, like I said, most of them all we were looking at were minimal impact projects. I mean, you, you will have right away impacts on some of these projects, but you they'll be minimal. Um, whereas some of these you might have a lot larger impacts to right away. Right. I, I, my note was just to say that it seemed like there there may be some like station improvements that are totally within the existing impacted area. So I could see some of those being more appropriate in tier one being even less. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, and those can be something that we can make that case um, if it's internal um, for the same reasons we got these other ones reduced. So th this does allow for and gone case by case to yeah. tweak that, okay. This is just the general list. If we have a specific case, we'll look at what the impacts are and then make that determination. All right, here's the results of the tier two. That's pretty much it. Um, this was the funding break line. As you can see, um, over here is how much it went up and down in the rankings in the district. But as you can see, most of them didn't change any. So this really doesn't have a major impact on most of our projects. You do see some changes down here and a few up here. But um, for the most part, there, there wasn't a lot of changes at all. And it really wouldn't affect the funding scenario at all. Any questions about that? All right, we're getting to land use. Um, land use is made up of two components. You've got the L1, which is your transportation efficiency land use, and L2 is the increase in that number. Um, and they looked at a 20, uh, 10 year horizon year. So uh, that's what the, we've been using for our analysis purposes. Um, but the main critical thing about this is both of them, we're trying to look at what's a reasonable walking distance. So um, basically, in other words, higher density of population and employment in an area, uh, it's more likely that people will use other modes of travel as opposed to using single occupancy vehicles. So it's, it's geared towards having land use rules and practices that encourage that density of development. Any questions about that? All right. Okay, basically right now, um, land use factor is only applicable in area types A and B. Um, it's not applicable in like area types C and D. And what we found is this cr has created a significant imbalance, especially in like the town of Warrington and the town of Culpeper, where you have urbanized areas similar to what you have in Charlottesville, but they're not getting the credit for having those land use decisions. So this is basically trying to figure out how we can include that in those for those area types. Um, and here's a map that shows the different area types. Um, as you can see, a is mainly the Hampton Roads, Northern Virginia area. B is the Charlottesville MPO, the Fredericksburg, Richmond, and then the Roanoke, uh, Roanoke Salem MPO area. So everything else is, is, and then you've got the green, the area type C is the TJPDC, and then the other smaller MPOs in the district, in the state, and then everything else is area type D. Okay, for this one, we looked at um, varying the radius that they 
account for the data from because right now it's three miles so they looked at varying that number um, obviously we're talking about adding c and d to that um, scenario and then what's the weighting factor percentage um, that we were trying to achieve here at the bottom um, scenario six was basically is the one preferred scenario so i'm going to go through um, basically the criteria that we got to get to that. Um, um, as you can see, the weighting adjustment, most of um, area types A and B, they got almost half of their points from land use, where um, C and D get most of their points from safety. Um, but in those urbanized areas in the locality, in the rural area, they're not able to get any points here. And that puts them at a significant disadvantage. So basically, this is a table that shows the differences between um, the first two tables that I showed you. I put this in the right order. Oh, yeah, this is the um, percent of the land use. No, this is not in the right order, I don't think. Go back one. Okay, this is the benefit score. This is where the project got its benefit score. Yeah. Um, so it's not the weighting, it's the where they got their benefit score. So you can see that and that. And then this here is the difference between the weighting percentages that we use for determining what their score is and where they actually got their points from. So this shows you the difference between those two. Um, and as you can see, the green is where you're over producing points and the red is where you're under producing points. Um, so you can see that um, land use has a significant impact in these areas and um, safety has a significant impact in here. But like I said is, they're not getting anything for really much for economic development and very not much for safety. So those are really where they're not doing as well. So what we wanna to try to do is correct for some of this. Um, so this is what they propose for the changes. Um, basically, they're taking 5% from accessibility for area type B and moving it into land use. Um, they're taking 10% from area type accessibility and area type C and moving it to land use. And they're taking 5% in area type D from uh, accessibility and five from economic development, putting it in land use. And then what they did is they re-ran the numbers. Um, and this is the benefits, where the benefit scores come with those changes. Um, and you can see the green is still high, but the red is not as bad as it was before. And the differences are the differences down here. So any questions about that? It's a lot of material to take into account and it's just a way to try to address this imbalance that we've seen over the previous four rounds of smart scale for the most, mostly the rural areas. Um, so Chuck, do we think that in those categories with C and D that this will help balance it so they'll get more projects? Is that what we're expecting? Well, I, I'm gonna show you what the results are of that. And this will, in those urbanized areas, you'll see, I'll go to that slide and show you. Okay, here's the results. Um, <clears throat> of the change. Um, and basically, you see these four projects here are out in the current situation and they're in in the, in the new situation. These three projects are in and they're actually going to go out. These two of these projects are in the in the uh, one, Fifth Street Hub is on the south end of Fifth Street, right at the county line. Emmett Street Multimodal Project is right on Emmett Street, right there by Barracks Road Shopping Center. And Covington's Corner is up in Fauquier County, up north. So uh, that was on. But the three that got added 
um, well, four that got added. Lee's Mill is is um, an inter an inter um, intersection improvements in northern right in Opal, on the northern end of Opal. But the other three projects, two of them are in the town of Warrington, and one of them is in the town of Culpeper. And these are major in their dense urban area, and they had no way to get these funded. Um, and this will give them some a leg up. Um, I will I will couch this in one thing. We got an additional $105 million of revenue this time. So we were able to fund a significantly number of projects, which we normally wouldn't get in the, now or in the future. So um, keep that in mind. We got a lot of projects funded. And so a lot of these projects that we did get funded, we wouldn't have gotten funded in a normal round of smart scale. So any questions about that? I've got one more slide. I do actually have a quick question. Okay. Uh, so on the bare wallow and robling that piece, uh, I'm looking at the uh, smart scale score and how that one seemed to score so low laid in comparison to the ones that were out. Is that just based on funding budget? Is there some reason why a 0.46 would beat out something like 3.78? Well, I mean, right now it's a 0.46, but if we, I don't, I don't have the new numbers listed here. If you add land use, <clears throat> it jumps way up and falls in line with the projects that are around it. Okay, so those, those scores haven't been updated with the different these approach. These scores that are listed here are the actual scores in the original applications, okay. not the revised scores. Um, I was going to put the revised scores, but I didn't have time to actually pull the data in because it's it's All not fair. easily listed in there together. So I'm having I would have had to create that column and I didn't really have time to do it this morning or today. But those scores would all be different That's to different. where they would it would it would rank in. And you know, each one is true though under smart scale that some projects with lower scores end up getting funded ahead of ones with higher scores because of Sometimes projects with higher scores ask for a lot of money and there isn't enough money left to fund them, right? Yeah, I mean, and here, when I get to the next slide, I'll show you some examples of that. All right, this is a combination of all, both, both the environmental and the land use. And um, if you see these, these projects that are down here in this light color green on the left side, those are other projects that were funded this round that um, when we went back afterwards and worked with the CTB member, we were able to get those projects funded. Um, just to let you guys know that what we analyzed was just the original funding scenario, not the final funding scenario. So during their meetings and working with the districts, the CTV members, they barter a little bit on projects that they're gonna get funded. Looked like that Hillsdale South Extension had a had a hope in one of those scenarios that I, you showed earlier. I was surprised by that. He, well, some of it, it's got to do with how some of the other projects did. Um, so it, yeah. In this one, it didn't do as well. Um, as you can see, the scores, it's about the same. So it didn't really change that much. It went down a little bit. Just see some of these other ones went up. And the reason it did well, I think if you look at the different scenario that it was in, yeah, you're still talking three mile radius. No, this is one mile radius. Uh, I can't remember what this one was. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look and see what that one was. It was just a side comment. No worries about it. Yeah. But that's my whole slide deck. You guys got any questions or comments or hopefully I put, didn't put everybody to sleep. I appreciated the walkthrough. It's good to see uh, how, how you guys are taking a look at it, approving your approach, especially for well, those areas, land use of, you know, 
different we, needs. I mean, like, like I said, initially, we do this, we go through and critique the process every round and to see how we can make improvements to it to if fix loopholes or improprieties that show up like that first round when we had projects that were getting all their points from environmental and they were getting selected for funding and they didn't have any benefit from, from any other category. Um, and so we, in round two, we changed that right away. So we do make tweaks every round and they vary from round to round. But this is one of the ones, land use has been one of the ones that, um, especially for most of the rural parts of the state have been pushing to get done for a long time. Um, Chuck, just to clarify, uh, the, the Commonwealth Transportation Board is accepting comments on this process through December 3rd. Or is, is the general public able to make comments? Yes, they can submit them to the website. And I don't have that email address readily I have, available. I have it. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, yeah. If you can put it in the chat, if you can send your comments to their, their website, um, they will, uh, Brooke will collect them and um, they'll take them into consideration because they're basically getting comments from everybody, including still getting comments from us. So, all right. Well, that's my whole presentation. Um, yeah, if nothing else, thanks, Chuck. You're welcome. Let me unshare, I think, while I'm yeah. on. Did I have something else to do? I thought I did. There is one other piece uh, in a few minutes, which will be a staff update at the VDOP project. I can do that. I can do it then. Okay. Not a problem. Okay. Great. Uh, well, so Lucinda, uh, we have the sh transit planning and project updates for the MPO. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to update you guys on the two transit projects that we have, um, that we're conducting this year. The, um, the Albemarle Transit Expansion Study and the Regional Transit Vision Study. So they're both DRPT grants that are funded by the localities and like it's a 50-50 match. So it's funded by the localities and DRPT. Um, the Albemarle Transit Expansion Study started in the spring of 2021 and it goes until the spring of 2022. It's looking at the Pantops, Monticello and 29 North areas. And it's a short-term project to expand transportation in the short term um, to those areas of the public transit. Um, it's, it's already conducted a transit propensity and land use analysis, which is available on the website. And I'll put links to the T-Webs project websites in the chat and all of this information is there as well. Um, they've conducted a couple of public and stakeholder meetings and they've developed a dra draft scenarios for each of the three study areas. Uh, and at this moment, they're gathering input on those draft scenarios. The scenarios are on their website um, and through a survey and the survey will be closed um, next week. So it'll be right around Thanksgiving. So um, we encourage you to go to the website and look at the scenarios and please give us feedback via the survey. You can also email me if you have comments outside of the survey. Um, and then, we will be gathering, the study project group will be gathering all of those comments on the three different scenarios for those three different areas, um, developing final recommendations, and then working um, to hopefully develop a plan to implement some of those scenarios that were selected by the community. The second study that we're doing is the Regional Transit Vision Plan. And this is a longer term study. It goes through 2024 um, and it's looking at transit through the entire region of the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission. So that includes the rural counties as well as Charlottesville and Albemarle. Um, it started as, as well as, as the first project in the spring of 2021 and it's going to end in the summer of 2022. Um, it also has completed the transit propensity and land use analysis. Those are available on the website. It also has conducted several public and stakeholder meetings. 
The next public meeting is tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom, and I am hoping that some of you will come and share your opinions with us uh, during that meeting, and also invite other people you think might be interested as well. Um, there's also a survey on the website about asking about um, your vision for transit in the future for the entire region. And this is like, be creative, think big picture. So, you know, anything, just dream big <laughs> and share with us, you know, your visions for transit, um, you know, all the way out until 2045. And um, after that, we will, the study team will start drafting alternatives and um, then gather, present those alternatives and the vision that we've gathered from the community so far. Um, and we'll present those drafts and have more stakeholder and public input, um, and then make a plan recommendation and um, gather more stakeholder and public input, and then have a final report for that transit vision for the future of transit in our area. Um, so I'll just put, the links in the comment period, I encourage you to participate in the surveys and the public meeting tomorrow night. And um, I don't know if you have any questions. Lucinda, do you happen to know if that public meeting tomorrow night will be recorded so we can go back and watch later if we aren't able to make it? Yes, it will be. And it'll be posted okay. on the website within a week. Thank you. The other, the meetings, the other meetings for both of these are also on the websites, so you can go view those as well. Great. Any questions for Lucinda? No, the other, the only other thing I'll add is in addition to you all hopefully taking the surveys and being aware of the public hearings, feel free if you have other networks of people that, you know, you think should should be represented in the feedback that we get that you're also sharing that opportunity as well. Lucinda, have you thought about, uh, we have a, a corridor study in our area, Royal Corridor, traffic corridor study. And we've been, we've had uh, uh, on-site meetings. We've had a tent out at different sites. Have you thought about doing that as well? Or putting out flyers at different sites? That, that would be wonderful. Um, we don't have it in the budget to do that at the moment, but we definitely have been sending um, information to our stakeholder groups and encouraging them to not only participate themselves, but um, reach out to their networks. And we're working uh, very closely with the three transit providers, CAT, John, and UTS, the University Transit System. And they have had their drivers handing out flyers that we've developed on both of these studies and ways to participate. Um, and posted them at the transit center and on the buses. So we're definitely working with community partners to get the word out. Have you gone to the library, for example, and libraries and put things up there or? Um, I, I, have, I have not gone to the library. I just came from a meeting um, earlier today working with the um, health and transportation group. I have, um, Albemarle County has posted that on their e-newsletter, posted about these, um, several of their e-newsletters. Um, and we're really relying on uh, our public, our um, partnerships with other organizations to get the words out. Do you have a time period when you're sort of gonna close down sort of this first line of survey? Yeah, so both of the surveys we're gonna close right after the Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you, yes sir. Any other comments, questions? Great, um, well, thank you. Uh, moving to the next step would be uh, the staff updates. Starting with Sandy with the Ravenna River pad and bike. Yeah, um, just, just real briefly, I wanted to let you all know that we um, just finalized the appointments of all of the different um, representative groups, the individuals that would represent each of those groups um, to the committee. And so we have our first committee meeting that's scheduled, will be scheduled for um, November 30th. And there are some of, some of you all that, um, that 
will be represented there, whether it's um, representing CTAC or the planning commission for your localities. So we'll start that process. Um, I'm working on getting a website set up that will have all of the information. It is updated. We haven't quite figured out where we're going to post the meeting information, but I'll put that in the chat so you can follow it. That um, process as well. And then um, it, it does have a placeholder where there's a meeting date and time, but we don't have the actual meeting information um, posted yet. Um, so we'll be we'll be starting that process, hopefully meeting monthly for at least uh, three or four, maybe five um, meetings with that stakeholder advisory committee, depending on um, on you know how, how whether or not we need two meetings or or one meeting to to um, get through certain conversations and work through priorities to help determine the projects to choose um, moving forward. So so that one's in good shape. And then for the other um, smart scale projects that we will be developing, we're really going to start um, tackling those um, in more depth starting in January. Um, I'll be working with the localities and with VDOT to develop an outreach plan for the um, District Avenue roundabout, which will have some impacts on on um, a couple properties. So we wanna make sure that we're providing good outreach and engagement with those who will potentially be affected. And then um, we'll, we'll meet with um, the localities to develop a better concept for the um, Avon Road multimodal improvements that they want to include in the, uh, in, in the application as well as for the Fifth Street intersection improvement and um, multimodal improvements. And so we'll have those meetings with the localities to get a better idea, and then we'll reconvene those working groups that had been involved as part of that plan as well to um, review that feedback and get some, some um, input from them prior to developing those applications. We are planning, some of you may recall that last year or last cycle, we, um, we did, a big uh, public um, workshop to go through all of the projects. So we will plan to do that again to cover all the projects that will be submitted within the MPO area to include projects submitted by the MPO, the PDC, as well as Albemarle and Charlottesville. So we'll also be planning on doing that once we have um, the baseline for what we're planning to submit um, um, worked out with all of those. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions for Sandy? Yeah, Sandy, I'm a little unclear a little bit. So go back to your first statement about different committees. Maybe I missed the last meeting. So tell me, what is it that you're appointing people to? That's why I was. The only committee that we're actually appointing people to right now is a stakeholder advisory committee to help us develop the actual application for the Ravana River Bridge, um, oh. bike ped bridge crossing. That's the, okay. that's the one project that the policy board felt needed an actual committee, but we are planning to do additional um, engagement and outreach with for, for all of the projects at different levels um, based on what has occurred so far. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Great. All right. Thank you, uh, Sandy. Uh, Chuck, uh, for the VDOT project pipeline. Yeah, I'll quick be quick about this. Um, we wrapped up our second round of stakeholder group meetings with the uh, Albemarle County and um, the residency on the projects in the Albemarle County area, which is basically the Pantops corridor from Hanson's Road out to the interchange and then uh, the intersections at out there at Shadwell. 22 and, and 250 and uh, North Milton Road and 250. So um, we're basically wrapped those up. We gave them some, we provided them some uh, uh, preliminary recommendations, ideas more or less. And now we're gonna go through and do the in-depth alternatives analysis as, as well as um, uh, putting stuff together for a uh, future public meeting, which we were, plan we were planning probably for January sometime. Um, and that's where we're at with those. Uh, they've developed a website and it's at uh, 
Uh, I can put it in the chat, vaprojectpipeline.org uh, is the website for the entire program and each project has its own page. So, um, and we will be updating that with material as it becomes available. Um, we're also putting together a district website that's gonna have this project specific to our district in them. Um, Lou's working on that now, so we should have that up by next week sometime. And it'll have um, the presentations from all of the kickoff meetings for all of the pipeline projects we have in the district. Any questions? Yeah, just a matter of clarification. Uh, we have a roundabout that's going, that's been funded at uh, uh, John Warner and Ryo. Well, how does that, how do you define that? Is that in your pipeline and where does that stand? Just to... um, That was a small scale application from yeah. last round. Yes. Um, it, it's a funded project and I've seen the plan for the Rio study or the Rio road study. And they're looking at shifting that location um, further to the North into that uh, green area there uh, near Dunlora. Um, We'll see how that goes. Um, uh, that'll have to go. That's since that's a funded project, that's not something that we're going to reevaluate. It would have to go in uh, to the smart scale working group uh, to review the changes that they're proposing um, to see if it still meets the criteria. Um, and if there's additional funding resources that are needed, those might be the responsibility of the county. Okay. Um, so that's how that plays out. Um, and I know they're looking at submitting another project from that study. They're looking at possibly Belvedere connection uh, as a smart scale application for this round and talking with the county, but we'll see. Um, we're waiting on their consult, the county's consultant to actually provide us more material. So we have something else to look at because we haven't received anything else since we got the initial material early, late summer, I think. So if, if uh, just to help me, if, if you don't receive anything more from the county, what would be the next step? Um, well, we may move forward with the project um, as it is, because we don't have any other information. Mm -hmm. And we will go through that process like we would normally would, wouldn't have a public hearing and everything, but um, we would develop the project as it was submitted. And when would that occur, assuming you don't hear anything more from the county? Um, I'd have to look at the schedule since it was just funded last round. I wouldn't say it would start any time in the next year or so. We would start uh, working on the... Uh, PE, I know we're looking at accelerating projects because mm -hmm. of uh, uh, funding. So we've, uh, I don't know if that's one of the ones we were accelerating, but generally it takes like five to six years to actually go through the process to get it designed, acquire the right of way, move the utilities and then build the project. If the, if the county wanted to accelerate it, what do they have to do? They have to let you know? Um, if we're accelerating it, I'd have to look and see. We're looking at manpower and uh, what our resources are, to, and we're focusing on, I know we're looking at the two projects up on, on 66 as uh, accelerating those, but I don't, I, I'd have to go back and look and see if this was one of the ones that we were looking to accelerate. I don't know for sure, but there is a schedule and I have to, I can get the schedule and, and uh, provided to the PDC or to Sandy and they could get it to you guys. I appreciate that. That would be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, I, I would still- you, Could you yeah, Lisa. The, uh, the website again that uh, for the project- Okay, pipeline. it's BA project spelled out, pipeline spelled out, dot org. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Chuck, uh, just to follow up, uh, maybe you already addressed it, but how, how, if the county did want to accelerate, do they have any voice in that, any projects, um, or is that something top down? We, we usually try to reach out to the locality um, to see if they want to accelerate it. I, it, it, like I said, it all depends on manpower. 
and um, we've got some political pressure from on Fauquier County, and I know those projects got pushed forward because it's on the interstate at the 1766 inter intersection. We've got a lot of issues up there, so that one got moved up to the front. Now the rest of them, I know we're looking at the hydraulic or Hillsdale or hydraulic 29 projects as a bundle. So that's gonna go to design build and they're gonna have the public hearing on it in the spring. Um, and just hold on one second. Let me see if I can pull up the email. Um, we have a quarterly meeting and we, and when they usually post all the projects and it also shows the um, schedule. So let me pull it up and see if I can find it real quick. If you guys wanna go ahead and move on and then I'll let you know when I get this information pulled right. up real quick. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. Um, while we wait for that, uh, we can move into the future discussions topics uh, time frame. So, uh, any thoughts, any any questions we might have for the staff or anything you guys have for one another on the committee that you guys would like to discuss concerning, you know, transportation? Uh, I'll just mention that I uh, uh, reached out to Tim Padalino uh, from Albemarle County and also uh, uh, Chris. Jensick uh, with City Parks and Rec on the Ravana Trail Gap. Uh, this is related to the Ravana River crossing, but there's a gap in the Ravana, uh, Ravana Trail from Woolen Mills up to Riverview Park. Uh, and part of, well, right now, the only way you can get from one to the other is to walk down the middle of Mark, East Market Street and, and up uh, Riverview uh, Drive or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, so they had some in interesting comments about that. Uh, most of that falls in the city's bailiwick. Uh, and I, I guess at some point they're considering approaching property owners because there's, there's no good way to widen uh, East Market Street. It's, it's, there's no sidewalks, there's no room for sidewalks, there's, you know, there's just uh, the terrain and everything makes it impossible to, to, to do anything much there. So pretty much their only alternative is to go up along the river bank, uh, which would be through private property. So they're, they're looking at the possibility of you know, seeing what, how the residents there feel about that, whether they'd be willing to uh, either grant right away or uh, at least consider, you know, selling right away for a reasonable amount uh, to extend the trail. But I think that's one of the key pieces to wherever that bridge winds up um, uh, so that it's, that it's consistent, so that you have access to woolen mills and also city to Charlottesville and points north uh, via the Ravana Trail. And so I, I just thought I'd mention that. Okay, Lee, was that something that we wanted to share with Sandy and others to make sure that they noted that as part of the overall approach? Well, I, I, I think it would be worthwhile. It's, it's, uh -huh. it's part, of the, part of the big picture there. Makes sense. Thanks for raising that, Lee. Yeah. Um, Something that I'm hearing a lot about recently, and I'm not sure if this is the venue for it, but I was just curious about if there's anything we have insight on, is uh, the, the strip between uh, Best Buy all the way up into uh, near Trader Joe's. I'm sure you guys are aware of it if you ever drive on 29. Um, is that uh, the backup into the road from Canes? Is, is there anything that is being done about that from our perspective? Just, I just want to know if there's anything going on with that. I know we have a sign up that Blink saying don't get into the road, but is there anything else that's being done to forward prepare for that that's being discussed by the MPO? Any planning? That's a question I have. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, 
that might be a private property capacity issue. I, I, I don't know, Chuck, um, was that discussed as part of the hydraulic small area plan? Um, it was, it's an issue, an ongoing issue, but we didn't really discuss it per se. I mean, we were mainly focused on the intersections, not necessarily mm -hmm. those commercial access points. Um, I mean, the problem is, is there only have that entrance and no other way to go anywhere else. Um, you really need, I know we've looked at this a couple of times about possibly having a connection in the rear to connect a lot of those properties so that they wouldn't necessarily have to use 29 as their only at means of ingress and egress. But it's, it's going to cost boatloads of money to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it's, I, I'm not sure if there is a solution there, an easy solution. All right, I'm just interested because it's probably going to turn into a more of a health hazard at some point, not just uh, food, it's not my point, it's transportation, but. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go back to some of the stuff we looked at previously, um, in some of the earlier studies for um, H250, I know they were looking at possibly an underpass with a parallel road on that side that, and they wouldn't, all those businesses would have access off that roadway as opposed to off of, two, off of 29. So I, but that hasn't really been talked about since that study was done probably 17 years ago, maybe 16 years ago. All right. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Just curious. I'll, I'll, I'll ask around and if there's a way to um, address it or have a discussion about it, I will certainly see if there's somebody who would be able to facilitate, you know, sort of at least an explanation or a process or potential um, discussion of what solutions might exist. That'd be awesome. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Uh, is there anything else before we, uh, are you? Yeah, are you I, have, I have one other thing oh, to bring up traffic. <laughs> uh, I go up a lot of times uh, towards Pantop, but I think it's 250 going over the free bridge and there's always a backup and around rush hour and, and actually during the daytime as well. Is there anything in the plans or to address that particular area, Chuck, in terms of reducing the backups, the traffic, handling, I don't know, the lights differently? We just redid the signal timings, I think earlier this year. Um, we've got an intersection project at Route 20 and 250 um we we're, we're looking at where that where there's no median in there uh the area where there's no median we're looking at closing that median um up to the hansons road and then the current pipeline project is looking at the from hansons road all the way out to the interstate um that corridor has been an issue for a long time um and it's not necessarily anything that we can do the real bottleneck is that um, those two intersections on either side of the river. Uh -huh. And um, we're looking to fix the one on the county side, but the city hasn't really pursued anything on the city portion of it. Um, I know we did look at a, submitting a project for one round. Was it last round? Round three of Smart Scale, Sandy? I wasn't here in round three. Okay. <laughs> But I think where so. they submitted I, that a project familiar. for the MPO actually did the study and they looked at um, improvements along that whole section of road and widening, not necessarily widening the bridge, but um, removing the sidewalk from the bridge to provide an additional travel lane across the bridge and putting the bike pedestrian facility adjacent to the bridge. Um, but that hasn't been pursued um, since then. So um, <laughs> Other than that, that's pretty much where I'm at. I mean, we're trying to work with the city on um, the signal at High Street, but um, we're we're not we don't have any solutions right now. Well, part of my my uh, 
my lack of knowledge. Which side of that is the city and which side is that the town? High Street, the west side is the city and that's High Street. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And like I said, Stony Point Road where 20 comes in, that's what we're, we're gonna rebuild that intersection okay. and reconfigure it and add pedestrian facilities. Um, um, and, and that was a project that was funded in round three of Smart Scale. Oh, I apologize. Okay. That was actually funded in round four. Four. Yeah. Okay. okay. How would we, as a as a group, get that area readdressed again back up to the MPO? What's that process, Sandy? Or is there a process? <laughs> the pro the process to focus on that area. Yeah. Well, it, it would really be the LRTP would be the the first place to make sure that you know what what that that. Those were, um, I mean, I guess the goal would be to identify those as, a, as part of the constrained list of projects we would want to prioritize. Okay. Um, but if there was, I, I'm not familiar with the study that was completed, Chuck, but um, I mean, is that study still relevant at this point? We just need to go back through it or would we need to do another analysis? I mean, we, we looked at a whole lot of scenarios. We looked at the river crossing at, at uh, Riverside Park. We looked at um, several scenarios at Freebridge. Um, we looked at, um, oh geez. I mean, at one point we even looked at that connector road, Eastern connector was a part of it, but we ended up, that one got ruled out pretty quickly. So most of the improvements focused on the high, the corridor 250 corridor um and then i think i alternative i and i think alternative f one of them had improvements at each intersection and then the other one had um improvements on the corridor which included widening not widening the corridor but um, adding an additional lane across the bridge by taking the sidewalks off and putting the pedestrian facilities separate and then you could extend a six lane section all the way through both intersections and terminate it before you got very farther along beyond that point, just so that you could better get better operations through that corridor. Um, and I, I don't, we'd have to go back and pull the study. I don't remember off the top of my head what the different options are, but that, those were, two of the ones that there were preferred solutions that were pushed forward. And it seems to me the MPO might have submitted one of them or there was talk about submitting one of them. I don't remember. Yeah, I, I, think it, I feel like it was an application that was, we were on the verge of submitting the, the project in the county or the city, I think, fairly late in the process. So that might have been, that that might have been be withdrawn. And that could be it. I, I don't recall. So what's happening, I mean, just to give you just a, uh, an actual uh, commuter, uh, when I have to go through that, I cut through uh, uh, residential streets now to get around most of that, which is not a good thing to do. And I think more people start do. I, I see people doing that right now. So I think really, I don't know if that's a, is that a criteria, Chuck? Let me ask you. That's part of looking at alternatives to see where people have options to go through residential streets to get around bottlenecks. I mean, we can look at it um, and we know that happens. And we, I know with hydraulic in 29, we looked at the whole network because you've got a, a large network of roads that um, people could use to make the maneuvers that we were eliminating at that intersection. Um, but with regards to what they do um, naturally, I, we don't really look at that closely because we don't have data that that's, that's O and D data that, that maps your trip to know that, that people are making, uh, cutting through a neighborhood or not. I mean, we've done it on some roads where we'll basically set up um, license plate readers at both ends to see who's going through and or whether they're just stopping on the, in the in the middle. 
sort of as a general comment, I would say that now with the GPS systems, and I've, I can even send you an article about it if you want, that sort of says that people, that it's hard to predict where the traffic is going. And I've actually heard our board, one of the board supervisors in Avalar, sort of actually comment that she was surprised that people are going on residential streets. And I, as I said, I go on residential streets. And I, you would think that would be something that VDOT ought to consider uh, doing on a more routine basis when we have bottlenecks, traffic bottlenecks, particularly at rush hours, lunch hours, you know, in that area. I'm just kind of surprised that they're not doing it right now. I mean, we look at that data. Streetlight is one of the tools that we use, and it mm -hmm. uses your um, it uses GPS data from mm -hmm. your cell phone um, when you're using an app, and it'll track that, and they pull that data together, and they can show what your um, not your trip, but where the trips are going on that corridor. But it the Determine whether it's a bypass trip or somebody cutting through a neighborhood, that's a little bit more difficult. Okay, okay, fine, thank you. That's interesting, maybe we'll come back to that at some point. Thanks, Marty. Maybe, maybe people okay. just aren't as savvy as you finding alternatives. <laughs> All right, um, so I, I think uh, if there's nothing else for future discussion topics, um, I think we're ready for matters of the public and I do not see anyone new. If someone could correct me on that. Great, if not, um, I think we can wrap it up. Uh, anything else before we adjourn? All right, I think we can call it then, uh, 828 then. Thanks everyone. See you all in two Good. months. Hope the next Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you, happy Thanksgiving. I'll Thank give you happy Thanksgiving. to Sandy happy Thanksgiving. on the uh, project and send it to you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving.